Welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Clemens Hoffman. Each week we will discuss tools, tips, and ways to radiate your best life ever, interviewing practitioners, authors, and luminaries to help you on your path. Wellness, joy, peace, abundance. What do you want to radiate? Before we get started, I just wanted to give a huge shout out and word of gratitude for those who are keeping us going. Everybody who's working in the medical field, all of our doctors and nurses, all of the people working in the hospitals, and all of the people at the grocery stores, convenience stores, and gas stations who are keeping us going. Thank you. That means so much. And to those of us who are confined at home, keep it up. Nobody likes this, and it's not fun, but there is a lot to be gained from it, especially our health. So thank you, everyone. We are in this together. Hi, and welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. I am your host, Christy, and we are here to radiate fascination with Marie D. Jones, who is a best-selling author of 20, over 20, nonfiction books on everything from disaster preparedness to the paranormal, ancient knowledge, unknown mysteries, UFO, UFOs and aliens, surveillance and technology, conspiracy theories, metaphysics, spirituality, cutting edge cutting edge science and so many things that I am personally interested in and I would think that our listeners are interested in too. So Marie, I have been so looking forward to talking to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yes, I'm so I've been so excited and so nerdy and <laughs> geeking out over this <laughs> <I tell> you. <laughs> Marie, I first heard you. Technology is good. (laughs) (laughs) Such a nerd. So, Marie, I first heard you uh, on uh, Jim Harold's podcast, the Paranormal Podcast. Right. Uh You were talking about your book, Eleven Eleven: The Time Prompt Phenomenon, and I know that that is something that people have been talking about for years, and it's still going on. Right. Yeah, what, mm-hmm. Where did you Where did you even start with all of your writing? Why did you Why did you choose all these various and wide ranging subjects? Well, I've been writing since I was old enough to hold a Quran, and I just knew from you know toddlerhood that that was going to be what I was meant to do. I wanted to do so many things as a kid. And really, writing was the only way that I could do everything. I could be an astronaut, a jockey. I really wanted to be a jockey, believe it or not. Um, I could be everything because writing allows you to research and oftentimes actually do some of those things to a certain extent. You know, I didn't become an astronaut, but then write about it and share it either through fiction or nonfiction or whatever um, arena you choose. So I actually started selling my writing as a teenager and I got into screenwriting. I, um, I wrote a couple of novels and about 12 years ago, I sort of stumbled into nonfiction, which I never, when I was younger, thought that I would do. I just thought, Oh, that's not that I was so intimidated by it, by the (laughs) research and everything. How does one stumble into nonfiction? (laughs) <laughs> I stumble into a lot of things that I'm kind of clumsy. Well, thus so the radio just, fascination. <laughs> that's right. So I, I'm the kind of person that I would always say, I want to do this, and then I would do it, you know, sometimes stupidly, but occasionally it paid off. And I remember I was writing, and I thought, I really would like to write a nonfiction book. And, you know, I really didn't know what to do at the time. So I wrote this book called Looking for God in All the Wrong Places. And at that time, I was kind of in a weird spiritual place where I was noticing that, you know, a lot of people look for happiness in external materialistic things. And so the book was sort of a a humorous commentary on how we look for happiness outside of ourselves. Yeah. 
and it got published. <laughs> Lo and behold, I don't know how. So it probably That's sold right. about 10 copies. <laughs> 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 but it uh, it got me my agent, Lisa Hagen, who mm. uh, is still my nonfiction book agent to this day. And I'm a dear, dear friend. And so when I signed with her, she said, okay, so, you know, for your first big book, what would you like to write about? And I said, um, I want to write about quantum physics and the paranormal. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, right, right? So up <laughs> my alley. <laughs> she says, you do know you don't have a background in that or a platform. I had no platform at the time. Oh, um, and I said, I don't care. That's what I want to write about. So I wrote up a book proposal, and I swear, I you know, this will lead kind of into the 11-11 and the uh, synchronicities and things that happen when people see time prompts. But mm-hmm. three months later, I had a book deal with New Page Books. Yeah. And that resulted in my first big book. Science, P-S-I-E-N-C-E, which is about quantum physics, consciousness, and the paranormal, and how there might be links between the three. And it was such a groundbreaking book that I was <clears throat> on some of the really big radio shows we, where I broke, you know, the numbers of listeners, and I, I was just bombarded with emails and messages especially from people in the paranormal community. And my father was a geophysicist, so I had a background in physics, and I was able to kind of vet the research with with him. That's awesome. So it took off from there. Yeah, and from there, it just never let up. Um, New Page said, okay, now what do you want to write about? And I did a book with my father about supervolcanoes. That was one of his specialties. And... um, I, then I wrote a book about, this was around the time of December 21st, 2012, and I wrote about the uh, Mayan mythology and all of that. Right. So then my publisher came to me and said, I, you know, would you consider writing a book about the 1111 phenomenon? And at the time, I had been discussing um, the paranormal with Larry Flaxman, who at the time uh, a paranormal investigator, we thought, hey, we should write a book together. So I I called him and I said, have you ever heard about the 11 phenomenon? We were clueless. Really? Clueless. So you were experiencing clueless. it. You were not experiencing the 11 phenomenon. Well, we, we both had, but we didn't know it was this big global thing with, you know, literally millions of people all over the world we took the, the, the challenge and did the research and wrote the book. So that book was, that book came out quite a while ago. The, there's a current one that's a revised edition, but it was really, and then from there, you know, I just was writing book after book after book, but 1111 was so shocking because, um, you know, occasionally you usually pitch a publisher with an idea I've had really good luck with my publishers coming to me with ideas too. Right. And, uh, but it was just funny because I, you know, I remember thinking, oh, why, what the heck? 11 11, huh? <laughs> and, oh, that's yeah. just me. And you hadn't even <laughs> experienced it, been experiencing it yourself. Not 11 11. I had always so said 333. Three. Yeah, there's three thirty-three. That was mine. <laughs> yeah, there are so many variations of it. So how do right, you but I, into research something like this? So so it's interesting because around that same time, my scientist dad was saying, Oh, you should write a book about numbers. And mathematics and mathematical ratios and uh, how <laughs> mystical and and I'm like, Dad, I can barely balance my checkbook. I hate math. I hate numbers. I hate them. <laughs> but oh, it, I was wrong. <laughs> it, 
And this is a world, I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon and people will reach out to me as a, a an intuitive and a healer and just saying, I'm seeing these repeating numbers and it's driving me crazy. Is there any meaning to this? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah, so there definitely, and you know, Larry and I talked and we were like, well, can we write a whole book on this though? And what happened was, is in the course of researching the time prompt and number and even letter synchronicities, I mean, these little time prompts, they don't always have to be, you know, a prompt or a synchronicity it doesn't always have to involve numbers. But we, I started to realize, wow, this is really going to be a book about the magical, mystical, supernatural, paranormal nature of numbers. Who knew? I love uh, whether it. It's, yeah, whether it's numerology or, you know, um, different divination systems, even astrology uses numbers. But the fact that numbers have archetypal symbolism, and it all began with the inquiry into well, why are so many people seeing these, you know, sort of synchronistic patterns and why do so many people see 1111 particularly? Yes. So, yeah. And that is an excellent, excellent question. And so what what conclusions do you feel like you came to in the book? Did you okay. find we what you came set to up? Two. <laughs> mm-hmm. We came to two. And, you know, people will sort of, it's almost like Democrat, Republican, left, right, one side of the fence and the other, the metaphysical and the scientific. Right. And, you know, I kind of have a feeling that the two go together because I've always felt like science and the paranormal are really just two different ends of the same yardstick. Right. So metaphysically, it appears that a lot of people have been seeing 1111 since the 70s. And I, I, you know, my agent told me that Oh, yeah, you know, my mom and her friends used to sit around the coffee table and talk about it decades ago. And I thought, wow, so this is older than, you know, than we thought it was. Yeah, this has been going on a long time. Yeah. So we're like, well, okay, 11-11 looks really good, right? It's it's got symmetry, it's balanced, the two, two ones, and the number one is so important and so symbolic mm-hmm. to us. But we found, interestingly, a connection that December 21st, 2012, which many people mistakenly assumed was the end of the world based on some misinterpretations of the Mayan calendar. Right. But the interesting thing about that was that the winter solstice on that day actually began at 1111. A.M. Greenwich Mean Time. Oh my God! So a lot of people thought that these time prompts that they were seeing were a little like a wake up call for transformation, mm-hmm. and a lot of people took it that way individually and personally, which I think is wonderful. Collectively, I'm not so sure. We seem to still be the crazy species that we've always been, but yeah. it was very symbolic. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I, so that, so, mm-hmm. oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, so you think that we maybe it's not quite the transformation we thought it would be. Well, it, or it happened on a level where it was more subtle. So after that date passed, though, I kind of thought sort of sarcastically, you know, said to Larry, I bet you we won't see 11-11 anymore. Mm-hmm. But then you kept hearing about people seeing it more and more and more. And also, a lot of the people that we talked to that sent us their their reports or their experiences said that they really felt like it was there was something spiritual or metaphysical behind it, that there was a meaning every time they saw it or some kind of synchronicity would occur that they never would have noticed had they not been paying attention. And the meaning has was either um, very individual to them or it was not even understandable, which to me suggests that it's something that is speaking to the subconscious. 
So you see 1111 over and over. Well, maybe you don't consciously understand what the message is, but I, you know, we really felt like it was a subconscious, again, almost archetypal, symbolic message. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said they understood. They knew what it meant the minute it happened or the second it happened. And others said they were clueless or they didn't find out maybe till a month later. We've heard of people that had quick sort of deja vu like visions or precognitive vision that later came true. So my feeling is it's directly linked to the scientific explanation, which is that our brains love a good pattern. And we have what's called the reticular activating system, the RAS, at the base of the spine, at the back of the head, that literally filters out unimportant information that comes in our brain. There are billions and billions of bits of information in order to allow the very little information we need to survive to get through. Mm -hmm. However, when something becomes important, the RAS will seek it out. So our brains are sort of tripwired to once we notice something more than once, maybe more than twice, now seek that pattern out. So if you see 11-11 once, you're, you know, big deal. Oh, it's 11-11, you know, almost time for lunch. If you see it twice in one day, you might go, oh, you know, how cool. Well, if you see it like eight times in one week, <laughs> yeah. your brain decides it's important. Now it's going to look for it more often. Interesting. Yes. So- and that's just how our brains work. It's like looking at wild wallpaper and you see a Tom Cruise's face in it or, or looking at clouds and you see a sheep. Um, we seek out pattern because we want to make order out of disorder or out of chaos Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right or like when you buy a car and then all of a sudden you start seeing that same car everywhere exactly exactly now in those blanks yeah Mm -hmm. but that doesn't eliminate a deeper more metaphysical or spiritual aspect of it because you know the brain If the brain kind of realizes something is um, trivial, oh, yeah, 11-11, how fun. Okay, I've noticed it 85 times. Now let's move on. But if it continues to, to, it's almost like if it continues to see it or seek out, and again, you are being pulled into the present moment of paying attention, and you start to notice synchronicities and things happening that, you know, when you're worried and stressed out over the past and future, you're not tuning in on. Now, that is very critical. Right. I think a lot of people feel like these time prompts are pokes from the universe to pay attention. That is what I had always thought of them as, to pay attention to your thoughts. Right. Right. Because mm-hmm. we don't. <laughs> we, do. we have no clue what we're thinking 90% of the time. Um, right. You know, we worry about the, the future. We regret and stress out over what we did in the past. And so every now and then, to have something like that just sort of snap you to attention. And people have said, oh, you know, I noticed something that I've never noticed before. Or I got an email from someone or a phone call or, or a book, you know, that leapt out from the shelf at me. I would not have noticed had I not had that, that sort of time prompt. And again, they can be words or phrases. Sometimes people even see images like an, a white owl or a black swan or something. And it's just... It pulls them into the present moment where they then notice even more of their surroundings or what's going on in their life at that moment. Right. And sometimes there's some important stuff that you need to see that you're just sort of glossing right over because you're 
you're so focused on the past or the future. Now, this goes beyond the brain just filling in patterns because it needs to see order. Where yes, do you, you like order. Right. So this goes beyond a simple explanation like that. How, what, do you, what do you think of the, the greater, kind of a greater spiritual meaning behind it, these synchronicities that are tied to this repeating number? I think sometimes we feel like our life is, you know, just sort of a chaotic mess <laughs> and, or we don't know what our purpose is, or we just, we don't feel like we have a, a plan uh, or a meaning. <laughs> so in a way, when we look around us at the natural world or just everything that's going on around us, it's very chaotic. It's very disordered. And so our brain consciousness, whatever mind, automatically go to work to try to create some kind of order that makes sense to us and also underlying meaning. Um, you know, it, for people that have lived through world wars where the, your life was just turned upside down, to be able to find some kind of purpose and meaning and continue on um, you had to create some type of order. You had to see a, a, a pattern, an order, a plan. But I think it even goes beyond that because, you know, having a physicist again for a father, when you talk about things at the quantum level and even things at the cosmic level out in the far reaches of the universe, it's total chaos to yeah. the human life. But there is an incredibly sophisticated order that if it were any different, galaxies, planets, star systems, and life itself would never have evolved. Mm. And, and there's a chapter in the book that called Just Six Numbers. Um, uh, Sir Martin Rees was the astronomer royal to the United Kingdom for a long, long time. I, don't know if he passed away or not, but he wrote a book called Just Six Numbers. There was about six mathematical ratios. And it's you know, difficult physics stuff, but basically what it boiled down to is these six ratios described how everything in existence came about. And if any of them were nudged one way or the other, you know, ever so imperceptibly life as we know it would not exist. The galaxies, the universe would not exist. That's how in intricate and sophisticated creation is, which kind of implies intelligent design. Right. I and know again, I well, yeah, and, and that leaves, yeah, that leaves a lot of debate as to, well, is this one big computer simulation? Is there a God? You know, who is the intelligence behind intelligent design? Because things do not, they might look random on the surface, mm -hmm. but they're not. There's no randomness. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, I've always thought there's really no debate between science and religion. They are part of the same spectrum. Which is exactly what you're yeah. talking about there. Yeah, it was Albert yeah. Einstein said you could either choose to look at everything as if it's all a miracle or nothing is a miracle, right? I right. he didn't he didn't say there was very much middle ground there. So you can look at everything and go, wow, this is amazing how it all ties together, or that is just chaos, right? Right, and and it's. A matter of perception and perspective, um, and we both, you know, I, we we when it comes to both, most people tend to have a very sort of narrow viewpoint, or they're operating with tunnel vision, because mm. again, we're so survival focused, and that includes, you know, going to your job and, and taking care of your family and doing your day to day necessities that. Our perspective isn't widened enough and our perception isn't cleared enough unless something 
kind of jerks us out of that comfort zone or that bubble. And it could be anything from a natural disaster to seeing a time prompt and realizing, oh, you know, that's cool. That's the fifth time I've seen five, 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 five today, <laughs> you know, and different, uh, you know, uh, different things. And wow, that's really cool. So they kind of take you outside of that little tunnel that you're, you're walking through that you call your life. And then you realize, oh my gosh, there's a lot of stuff outside the tunnel. And all of it is interconnected and interwoven. And it's like, whoa, what's the intelligent force behind that? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where religions come in because science wants to know what the laws of that force are, the natural laws. Well, religion wants to know more, you know, what is that force? Where does it come from? Right. What's is it, it a sentient conscious? Yeah. Does it have consciousness? Is it sentient? So they, like you said, they're exactly, they're on the same path to the same goal, just a little bit different perspectives and perceptions. Right. Two, well, two sides of the same coin, I think. Um, yeah. Just three exactly. ways to look at the world. Like you said, you know, you could look at it Democrat versus Republican, left versus right. I mean, these are different ways to look at it. Um, right. So these numbers, I mean, in your research, um, you looked at the, you looked at the numbers eleven eleven the three three threes the four four fours the one two three four you know all of the number combinations, but are there other things that kind of fall into that like birds or insects or um, common things that you might oh. see over and over again? Absolutely, one of the big ones is dragonflies. Right. You know, people, yeah, and or a certain type of bird, a bluebird or a robin. Um, yeah, and so time prompts, I just, you know, they're only one of many things that little synchronistic pattern things that people notice. Some people notice a, a word or a phrase or a song, you know, oh, right. you turn the radio on and a song uh, every single time. It's like, oh, my God. Do they really play that song 8,000 times or is it just because I'm tuning in? And that's really sort of telling because I'm tuning in at the right time to hear it. And that kind of tells you a lot about what might be going on. So absolutely. Um, and with the numbers, there doesn't even have to be the symmetry of like an 11-11 or a 12-12. Some people see... Uh, their street address number, you know, could be seven two eight one, but they see it over and over. And you know, we've had people say, "Well, that's because that's where, you know, I grew up and I had such a happy childhood, and my dad just died or whatever." And they might be able to find some kind of connection, an emotional connection to that number. And other times, again, people will just say, "Well, I really don't know, but I see it all the time." And again, I always feel like, well, our subconscious absorbs everything. And, you know, hopefully your subconscious knows and is processing it. And then maybe at the right time, it'll be revealed to the conscious mind. You know, those little aha moments? <laughs> yes. Oh. All of a sudden you get it. Oh, that's what's going on. And uh, Exactly. And sometimes people see um, their birth date, a loved one's birth date, or a loved one's death date that keeps repeating, right? right? Well, yeah. I mean, numerology and astrology, these divination systems tell us that, you know, times and names and names, letters can always be uh, associated with a number, that these are important. And that we're given our particular name for a reason, and that we're born at a certain time in a certain location, and it all matters. It all has meaning. It's, there's no randomness to it. I mean, you know, a lot of people believe, oh, it's just when you were born, big deal. Yeah. But if you believe in the symbolism and the power of numbers to represent something deeper, 
then the coordinates of the city you were born in, everything could be a part of that intricate, sophisticated order, you know, that we just talked about. And that includes your name. You know, you take your name and you boil it down to your master number and it can tell you things about your personality and tell you things that you need to look out for or avoid or whatever because it's all symbolic and there's a deeper meaning than just oh my parents decide to name me you know marie big deal and i don't like my name (laughs) (laughs) it's weird it's not weird i don't feel like marie fit yeah and so it's an interesting story though so when my mom got pregnant and had to name me that was not her first choice. Huh. She had other names picked out. And she was pressured by Catholic parents and grandparents to give me the name of, you know, you were supposed to have the name of a saint, or in my case, it was Mary, but the French version of Mary. So, right. And it's weird because since early, early childhood, I've always felt like sometimes people would say Marie, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even respond. I just felt like, that's not really my name. Um, and so that's how important a name can be. Mm-hmm. But at the same that's time, that's a name that I have. So there must be a meaning to that too. <laughs> have you looked at the numerology of your name? I did. I actually did. Uh, I did my um, birth name and I did my professional name because my professional name is Marie D. Jones. Uh, that was my uh, married name, and I kept it for my because it was on all my books. And my um, birth name was Marie de Savino. And wow. I looked at the two different master numbers, and I I think one was a four and one was a six. And the general consensus among different num- numerological systems for those two numbers seemed very very right on (laughs) interesting but my birth my zodiac my uh, i'm sorry astrological chart for uh, i'm supposedly a libra and what's interesting is you know if you look at vedic astrology you're the sign that comes before so you're a virgo and i don't have a lot of the characteristics for Virgo at all. And with Libra, I only have two that are really strong. I am a justice freak. I am (laughs) absolutely about justice and fairness, and it happened since I was little. And the other one is I can't make a decision to save my life. (laughs) (laughs) But then there's other aspects of Libra, like they're really into fine art and, you know, and I'm not at all. I'm like a, you know, I'm like a tomboy. So it's just interesting how, um, but but uh, quite a while ago, I had a real astrological chart that it was a 40-page chart yeah. that a woman did who had been, I'd been referred to. So it wasn't just your TV guide Zodiac, you know, it was uh, a very intricate, mathematical, detailed, and it was shockingly accurate and she didn't know me Um, so there's something to that there's something to the time of our birth the location our names and the number equivalents of the letters of our names and it's like magic because of course you can't prove it but I think it's it's on the same wavelength as thinking that our universe is made up of just six mathematical ratios that are intricate and intelligently designed. You know, it's, to me, it's just as, that's just as magical thinking as, you know, saying, well, I was born here at this time, and that makes me this. Mm-hmm. You know, again, the two sides to the same coin. It's, I mean, I think this just keeps pointing to our search for meaning. 
And right. there are so I many places that. we can find that meaning. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I'm lucky because I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I love to entertain and I love to teach people things that I learned. That I, oh, I'm so excited. I learned about these different palm trees. Now I'm going to tell you about them. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but I talk to people all the time that they don't, they still don't know, you know, what they want to be when they grow up or who they are or what they were put here to do. And sometimes people will say, well, maybe I wasn't put here to do anything. I'm just, you know, to be a parent. I'm thinking, oh, like that's, you know, that not is an amazing quite a job. Lot. Yeah. Please. That you know, is quite a lot. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a mom. Holy, holy moly. I mean, that's like the greatest thing I've ever done. So, yeah, people are searching for meaning, for purpose. They may not have all the same goals. Some people want to be rich and famous. Other people want to, you know, go off to a little island and, and surf and whatever it is that makes you happy and brings out your authentic self is is fine but sadly a lot of people they get so caught up in the day-to-day survival that they kind of push that back and so you wonder if some of these time prompts are meant to uh say hey 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 before it's too late pay attention you know like 11 11 a lot of people associated with angels Yes, and I do. some kind of uh, yeah, and, and actually a lot of the time prompts and numbers, there seem to be a sort of angelic correspondence, and people would say, "Well, I feel like it's my guardian angel, kind of poking me and saying, hey, hey, pay attention, something really good is coming, you know, and you need to be aware so that you notice it when it comes." And, so right. I I think that these little wake up calls could be telling they could be like signposts along the way helping people find more purpose and more meaning. Absolutely, I and I do think we need to find meaning in life. Otherwise, we're just wandering around like zombies and just bouncing around and reacting. Rather than being the captain and captain of our own ships, right? And, yeah. um, and so this kind of goes back to what you were saying about the just waking up and being aware of our thoughts. I mean, it's mindfulness, really, isn't it? It is. It really is, and that's like I think there. I think for some people, it would be easier for them to train for a marathon than to <laughs> meditate. <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're physical creatures. We're so focused on that kind of outward. Perf- I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I could never ever do a marathon. I used to walk <laughs> half marathons. That was hard enough. But but what I mean is that. For some reason, for so many people, quieting the mind and turning within is like the lowest priority on the chain or the ladder of priorities. Yeah. And people find it so hard to do. They do. Yeah, yeah. so hard to do. And if it's, if it's an external prompt that does that, well, then, you know, more power to them. Yeah. A lot of power. Yeah, and I'm... Can you imagine how many people have these time prompts and ignore them because, oh, I don't have time. Or they just are in some kind of weird denial. It's not a part of their worldview. Oh, that's, you know, silly uh, metaphysical woohoo stuff. Yeah. Or they just don't even see them because they're worried about the meeting that they have to get to in an hour that they're, you know, three hours late for. (laughs) So they don't even see it. Um, yeah. And I can imagine that that happens quite a bit. Well, then you wonder. But. The, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that you wonder about the people who are kind of new to that phenomenon. And maybe somebody tells them, oh, my gosh, I see 11 11 all the time. And then they start to realize that they are, too. And then I wonder yeah. how long it had been in front of their face 
and they didn't and know. They didn't it. see it. Well, and then some people will say, and I know this has happened because it's happened to me. Um, you know, if you don't pay attention to the subtle little messages, <laughs> that's when the universe comes out with a two by four <laughs> and whacks you in the head, and you get a disease or you have a heart attack or something, you know, big happens. Or collectively, right? Yes, or collectively, exactly. we have a pandemic. Exactly. We're reshuffling priorities and you either do it as an individual in your own life, but you, you know, like you said, absolutely. We do it collectively as a, a species and a society, as a country, as a, a planet the sort of reset or we change a little bit. And then as soon as it's over, we go back to default mode. And that's, you know, that's where the two by fours come quicker and harder. Right. It's like you don't get the lesson the first time. Did you know that radiate wellness has a subscription based premium content Facebook group? Think of it like the premium version of this free podcast. In this premium Facebook group, you can find great content like replays of online classes, meditations on angels, chakras, mindfulness, and more, guest speakers, mini classes, polls, plus you'll be the first to know of guests that we have scheduled for the podcast and can submit questions for them. You get all of this great content for one low monthly price, and the first month is half off. You can subscribe by going to radiatewellnesscommunity.com slash shop. Click the subscriptions button, and you're in. Also, while I have your attention, wherever you're listening to this free podcast, if you could just do us a couple of favors, please. One is go to hit the subscribe or follow button. Then you'll be notified of all of the episodes we have coming out each week. Also, please rate and review. It sounds really simple, but it helps us to grow our audience when people are looking for great podcasts. And when we grow our audience, we can do bigger and better things and bring you even more great guests. So please do those couple of things, and that will help us grow this audience and this podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You're, and, and that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why people still see 1111, even though that 2012 connection ended. Because I thought for sure when we wrote the book, oh, that's it. That's what people are sensing and seeing. And it just kept going and going. And I hear more and more and more. And then, you know, people having other time prompts, T22 or 333 or whatever. And uh, it's like, wait a minute, you know, either this is going viral and it's just sort of waking other people up, like you said, and now they're having these experiences, or there's an underlying reason, you know, something is going on to try to get more and more people to pay attention. Because sometimes things go viral and then, you know, oh, yeah, now I noticed that. Oh, it was right in front of me. (laughs) Um, yeah you know the brain (laughs) but it could also be that as we ignore or go back to that default setting more and more we don't ever make really good positive changes Mm. it keeps coming faster faster more 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 right right yeah just until we until we get it and until we wake up yeah And it does seem like the people who are awakening now, and it seems like there's so many people awakening. That's one of maybe one of the first things they notice is that synchronicity of the time prompts. Yes. I think synchronicities are one of the most fascinating things because they happen to us all the time. And there have been, there have been weeks, uh, you know, weeks and months of my life where they just, were coming like crazy, boom, 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 boom. And I thought, oh, my God, this is insane. And then they would stop. (laughs) Isn't that? Um, Or maybe I just stopped noticing them, you know? (laughs) That seems so true that it'll go in in waves, and maybe even the 11-11 phenomenon, 
you see 1111 for a month and then it's 333 and then yeah, 444 yeah. Right? Have you ever that's where a lot of oh go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's where a lot of people will say, "Well, there are different messages." Right. You know, the eleven eleven message is the activation of a doorway to the fifth dimension, higher consciousness, or whatever. Three thirty three means this, to, and and so again, we're trying to interpret. We're trying to find the meaning behind the pattern. I think Doreen Virtues had a hand in that. Um, in yes, absolutely. Numbers, right? Yes, she really and, did. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, Solaris, there was a book uh, about activating doorways to higher dimensions and levels mm-hmm. of consciousness. And that's a lot of what was really, you know, highlighted right around 2012. Like, oh, are we really going to, on that day, elevate from a three-dimensional living or fourth dimension, if you include temporal time, mm-hmm. you know, to a higher dimension? And probably a lot of people did that individually, but I think collectively we were still in kindergarten. You know? <laughs> we weren't quite ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it feels like that that was the beginning of those serious push toward moving to a, a new dimension. Yes, like the age of Aquarius. And, you know, there's always debate over when this starts and when that ends. And But I think a lot of people now are starting to awaken mm-hmm. in different ways, not just a metaphysical awakening, but also to how, you know, we we got to take better care of the planet. Our governments lie to us and we need to to be more proactive, we need to be stronger, we need to, people need to have more power, there needs to be more balance of, of uh, wealth and blah, blah, blah. So that awakening, but those, but I think that awakening goes hand in hand with a wait, an awakening of consciousness. Because yes. if you're still in that victim mentality, you're in a low state of consciousness. And once one is triggered awake, then it leads to, I guess, awakening in all areas of your life. Which I do think is needed. We've been on autopilot for decades now. And we're needing to, and we'd gotten so far away from, you know, the true heart of humanity. Maybe I'm getting way too far out there. Um, No, it's kind of funny. I mean, if you think about autopilot, Mm-hmm. You're basically turning controls over to you know the vehicle, which is your material body, and your body doesn't always know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's where the numbers come in. They're like sort of helping us coordinates to guide, you know, the the body and let the consciousness guide the body in the right direction. Mm, right. But yeah. It? Autopilot, definitely. Right, right. And had had you read, surely you've read the book, The Celestine Prophecy? Oh, yes. Eons ago. Absolutely. I love that. It's an oldie but a good. I remember, yeah, and I remember Shirley McLean came out with um, Out on a Limb, and there was just a whole bunch of stuff in that time frame. It was like a huge great awakening. I'm trying to remember what year that was. Gosh, it was... 80, uh, maybe 70s. Yeah, it was so cool. It was such a great time. And here we thought, oh, we're elevating. You know, and I think it's cyclical. Right. You, you, it, everything rises up, then it falls a little bit, then it rises up a little more. Um, but that was a wonderful time. Mm-hmm. Right. And it was, I mean, it, it just felt like we were such babies. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And then we got smacked down again with a lot of things that happened in the world. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I think we need those reminders. And I don't mean to trivialize something where, you know, where people are dying. But the planet, uh, the consciousness, the collective, it has its own plan. And it, it I think it seeks balance. Right. And equilibrium, and when that is not there, 
uh, you know, you hear people talk about how now all the wildlife is coming back into our national parks and cities have clean air and you can see the Himalayan mountains from, you know, this or that country. And I think, you know, sadly, yeah, we were really doing some damage. Oh, yeah. And I'm hoping that we'll we hey. look at these things and say, okay, this is something that's worth pursuing and continuing rather than, oh, that yeah. was a clip. Yeah. Oh, well, we need to start the economy again. Right. right. Yeah, Take everybody you know, people say, oh, the new normal. Well, what is the new normal? Is it going to be worse than the old normal or the same? Or, you know, what is that really going to mean? And so maybe it's worth talking about now revisiting these synchronicities, revisiting books like Celestine Prophecy and your 1111 Time Prompt Phenomenon book and some of these other texts. Yes. I have heard that there is a resurgence of interest in magic, Wicca, mm. nature religions, um, earth traditions, herbs, using herbs, homeopathy, uh, yoga, you know, all of these things that connect us more to the earth and nature right. are because we're small stuck inside or we can go out in nature a little bit, but, you know, we're not going in our normal out to eat and stuff like that, out to the movies and that people are rediscovering some of that lost magical connection, I think. Mm-hmm. Because you only find it when you're alone and quiet <laughs> and bored. <laughs> and bored, absolutely. And you don't bored. have <laughs> competition for your attention. So, no distractions, yeah. Yeah. So that would be good. That would be good to see that continue. Mm-hmm. See this trend continue. So let me ask you this, Marie. When you researched the book, um, did it change your views in any way? Did it change how you saw things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, uh, it gave me a real appreciation for numbers. <laughs> right. And it allowed me to make the connection between math numbers, mathematical ratios, and what I, you know, when I looked around, what I saw, the sky, the cosmos, the stars, my actual biological existence, and it gave me a deeper appreciation for the fact that there does seem to be an intelligent plan, blueprint, uh, design to everything. And if that's the case, that means that we're not just like randomly thrown here to eat, reproduce, and die. That there's been so much planning. It's like planning a beautiful skyscraper or building and then just leaving it empty. I mean, <laughs> what's the point? You know, or creating an absolutely amazing piece of art and then putting it in a closet. You know, it just seems pointless to think of it that way. So give me a real appreciation for the intricate, sophisticated, underlying nature of reality that we don't see. Yeah. Except how it's manifested outward. You know, there's that sort of hidden implicate order. Physicist David Bohm always talked about there being an implicate order and an explicate manifest order. Mm-hmm. And we only get to see one. <laughs> the other one is hidden from us, but it's nonetheless just as real. Mm-hmm. Well, this goes back to Einstein saying you can see everything as <clears throat> if it's all a miracle or as none of it's a miracle. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And even yep. what Gil Bolte exactly. Taylor said in her TED Talk about how we can choose to see how everything is connected and how we're all connected to everything, or we can choose to remain separate and shut off. Separate, yeah. Right? It is perception and perspective. And, you know, do you you choose to look through a tunnel 
or you want to stand outside the tunnel and see what's out there. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely opens up some questions for us and it opens up some possibilities to shift our perception. Wow. Um, but so you, so I do want to touch a little bit on the other work that you do, which is uh, the disaster stuff, the not so fun stuff, the um, more neat gritty, <laughs> the weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. I actually um, the disaster manual. I have over twenty years training as a. Um, I trained initially with Burbank Fire and Police and Disaster Preparedness. Then I came to San Diego, and I joined CERT, which is Community Emergency Response Teams. Mm -hmm. We're trained through FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, but we do the physical training through our local fire departments, and they're all over the, the country. Every city has CERT. Basically, we're second responders. You've got your first responders. When they need help, we're activated, and we're trained in everything that you could imagine. Right. So it just I really love that stuff. I love, you know, when everybody's freaking out and panicking, I like to know what to do. It doesn't help for me to add to the panic. It doesn't mean I don't get scared, too. But And then I realize, wow, I have an awful lot of information. I've done Red Cross training that I, you know, I could put this in a book. and. The manual is so complete because it's not just big disasters. It's the little things that can happen in your house. Oh. You know, a house fire or falling off a ladder or getting cut. And do you know how to treat certain types of burns, this, that, and the other thing? So right. I thought, okay, I'm going to make this as comprehensive. And guess what? Even with all my training, I still forget. So I have to actually go look at my own book. <laughs> Oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? Um, because people don't, you know, people say, oh, I could just Google it. But when you're afraid, you know, if you don't have your phone or whatever, it's good to have one book or a guide in your emergency kit that you can reference and have your kids look stuff up. I, yeah, nowadays we do have Google, but in disasters, the phones will not work. That's what I so, was thinking. I'm really proud of that book. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, tornado strikes, you've got your emergency kit, and hopefully that's yes. your kit. You take it with you, and you might not have internet access. You might not have electricity. That's right. Keep it up. Yeah, exactly. And there's right. so many things where even I was like, oh, my gosh, I, I've been doing the opposite. Oh, you know? wow. Because it's like, you know, you just... Sometimes people tell you and you're not really looking up the best information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've got, and then I've written, um, I've written about uh, the government's mind control program, MKUltra, through the 50s, through the 70s. I've written about domestic surveillance. I've written about um, media manipulation. I'm currently doing a book on propaganda, which is, Really, really fascinating to watch because it's happening, you know, real time. I get to watch it on the news every night. Right. And, that sounds um, scary, too. I, yeah. I'm writing about toxins in our food and water and air. Yeah. And then after that, I get to write a natural health manual, which is really good because I hate to present just all negative, scary stuff Yeah, without you know, being able to say, hey, well, here's the good stuff that you can do. And I always try to, even with the scarier books that I've written, I always try to offer proactive, helpful things that people can do. Otherwise, what have I done? I've scared you. You know, now you're not going to do anything. You've got to be <laughs> scared enough to act, but then you have to know what to do so you feel a little bit empowered. So. Exactly. Yeah. What's the point of yeah. saying you not offering some sort of hope? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I've written about time travel, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I'm looking at all of these, all of these um, titles. P.S. Science. You talked about destiny versus choice. The deja vu enigma. Um, power of archetypes. Mind wars. Super volcano. 
Um, oh my God, disaster survivor, but celebrity ghosts and notorious haunting. That was fun. <laughs> uh, how did you research that, that? Oh my gosh. That could have been 10 books. That was a blast. I mean, I literally was <laughs> immersed in really cool ghost stories and haunted locations. And it's like, I have a death here for three books. This is crazy. Well, but it was really fun. <laughs> I'll bet that I'll bet that was fun, but just so what? Just what a wide it, it, and even middle grade novels. That's amazing. Yes, I have a series that my son actually inspired. It was based on um, a, a spy group that he formed when he was in elementary school. <laughs> Funny. And he's in he's in college now, but we have I have to write book three at some point. Yeah, just you know. I didn't. Oh, I never wanted to be a niche writer. I got niched a little bit with paranormal, um, yeah. but I did manage to break out. And I wanted it to be very clear to my publishers: I want to write about a lot of things, you know, not just that. Well, and you certainly have succeeded in that. I mean, you've got just a little bit of everything. And I'm sure. Well, what is that saying? Uh, Jack of all trades, but <laughs> I mean, you know, but I say, no, no, I'm a Renaissance woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Renaissance woman. And, you know, being a writer, you can, like you said, you wanted to be an astronaut and a cowboy and a, you know, and all of that. Yeah, things. this is how you do it all. There's no, there's nothing, at, or unless you want to be an actor, but I don't like being on camera. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this, like, you know, when I was little, I was always telling stories. I was either telling them or I was writing them. Yeah. So it kind of, kind of was natural. That's incredible. That's incredible. Now, so I don't want to keep you anymore, but is there anything that you feel like we haven't touched on that's important to touch on or have anything coming up that you're really excited about? I, um, before the virus hit, I was going to be making my first independent feature film. I've made two short films I wrote and co-produced. Wow. So, and I was really excited. We were, we're still working on the script that we're taking our time over quarantine. Um, so hopefully when that lifts, we'll be able to start moving towards production. That That's really fun. I love screenwriting and I love novel. I love fiction and nonfiction. And again, a lot of writers will just choose one and stick with it. And I always felt like I can't do that. You know, I want to <laughs> be able to write all of it. And I've been really, really fortunate uh, that I've been able to. So that's exciting. That's, and so what is this <laughs> film project about? Can you say anything about that? I yet? can't tell you the plot. <laughs> the director will kill me, but right. it's a science fiction. It's a, it's a fun, uplifting story with a little bit of an edge. Sort of a cocoon meets um, close encounters kind of thing. And, but it will be done on a low budget. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> Very low budget, yeah. So that's <laughs> exciting. I'm working with the same team that I did my last short film with and a bunch of really great guys. And, and then I've got three more nonfiction books, no, four, I'm sorry, four, uh, scheduled through the end of next year. Uh, I have a novel, a horror novel coming out next year that I'm really excited about called 13. Ooh. And just all kinds of stuff. I'm always, always got stuff going on because I get bored really easily. <laughs> and I like to be busy. You know, I love to just have my hands at a whole bunch of different things. And then you've got these really cute prompted journals too. Yeah, that was a fun experiment. I have some journals that I did that are for sale. I also did a whole line of coffee mugs, but I haven't been able to sell those. Uh, Amazon changed all their rules lately of what they're prioritizing. Oh, but, you bad. know, I just, yeah, I just think, oh, I want to try that and I'll try it. If it fails, whatever. You know, at least I tried it. Yeah, and then you, mm -hmm. you, you satisfied that curiosity. 
It yeah. does. And it also tells me what I don't like. Like I'm not good at, you know, online marketing. <laughs> <laughs> kind of whittles down what you like, what you're good at, what you're not good at. Right, right. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. I could see having you back to talk about more stuff that you're doing. Because uh, my Well, God, we can so definitely do that. That would be my pleasure. Oh, I would love it, love it, love it. So we might, like, take a dive into your ghost stuff or your witch stuff. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> All kinds of stuff. So your website, of course, is mariedjones.com. And yes. your biography is there. All of your books are listed there. Um, all of these, they're called attitudinals, which I think is so cute. But just, oh my God, just looking at your books page, it's crazy. So many <laughs> books, demons. And <laughs> Wow. Uh, listen, I have I have colleagues that have like three times as many. We're sort of at a race and I'm like losing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a race that you can never lose because, uh, you know, exactly. all the are the winners, <laughs> right? Because we can read it all. Well, Marie, this has been absolutely fascinating and so much fun. Just so Oh, it has. Absolutely. Right? So thank I look you. forward to thank having you, you on yeah. again. Oh, thank you so much. And I look forward to having you on again. Absolutely. I would love to. Radiate Wellness is a community of holistic and alternative healers and consultants based in the Kansas City area dedicated to helping you create spiritual, energetic, and physical well-being. To learn more about our practitioners, services, classes, and events, or to schedule an appointment, visit us at radiatewellnesscommunity.com.